Yeah, the recording's just begun. It's not legal advice, but it will have to suffice because it's copyright brother, copyright brother, copyright brother. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, depending good morning, on where good you are Good morning, good afternoon, yes, depending yes. on where you are. So I'm Chris Morrison. And I'm Jane Secker. And uh, welcome to the 38th webinar in this series, which we retitled last time, Copyright and Online Learning at a Time of Uncertainty. We believe that we've passed the moment of crisis, but it's still uncertain. There are a lot of issues coming up, so that's why we are continuing with these sessions. And today's is one we're very excited about isn't it absolutely yes yeah we've got a fantastic lineup of speakers you have probably noticed it's not 11 a.m in the uk it's 2 p.m um and that was to accommodate um our, uh, our us um and canadian um guests who are joining us so um yeah we we will introduce them in a, a short while but um yep. we are recording the session for people who aren't able to make it because um, yep. we had a lot of interest in today's session. So Chris, tell us, tell us what we're going to get up to today. Well, we've got a few items of copyright news and we'll try to go through those as quickly as possible to get on to the, to the main event, uh, looking at codes of best practices in fair use in open educational resources. And we've got a really great response as well from Bart and Steph, who are working on a, uh, a European project, which incorporates many of the same um, elements of, of the work that, that the codes um, have have put in place. So let's move on just to a quick one about what we've been up to this week. We always like to check in. So it's been lovely and sunny in the UK and I hope everyone else has been out able to get some of the sunshine. So a couple of photos from our respective breaks. I managed to get up north. So that picture on the left is a picture I took while out running up in Lancashire um, where my uncle lives. It's beautiful up there. It's amazing. Um, yeah. Tough running, yeah, that's, that's, but it's brilliant. It's Manchester, you said you can see right in the far distance. You can see it, Manchester in the far distance. It was. It's Whitworth near Rochdale. Lovely place. And you've Very been nice. you've been making the best of the sunshine as well. I have. I have. Yes, I've been on the sunny Kent coast just uh, down the road. And this is my lovely nephew, Henry, um, who I took to Margate um, for a great day out. Um, actually, uh, Dreamland was only open um for drinks <laughs> he was very disappointed he couldn't <laughs> go on that big wheel and so the most exciting thing was this sort of quite old retro rocket which didn't go anywhere and he kept saying why can't i go on any rides so um yep. it was anyway it was a lot of fun a lot of fun and nice nice weather so good Excellent. week yes yeah good week Excellent. good to have time off as well but we're back so we're back here we are here we are yes and we're, we're on the case right so this is a reminder that all the previous webinars um, can be found on the copyrightliteracy.org blog. Um, and the, the, the last one, if you haven't seen that, it's worth catching up on as well because we had excellent presentation from the Open Education Special Interest Group um, of, of ALT um, and uh, uh, Teresa and Therese and um, uh, really great discussions around open education more broadly that really sets the scene for today's one. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So let's Without get on ado. to copyright news, 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 copyright news. So what's in the copyright news today? Um, we've got a bit of an update, haven't we, on the we have, copyright yeah. and online learning special interest group? Yes, we have. We actually had our second committee meeting. Um, this week on Tuesday um, of the committee and uh, we've got lots of exciting things planned, lots of things up our sleeve talking about some future events um, and uh, some of the areas that we're working on related to copyright and accessibility, about codes of fair use and uh, fair practice. So yeah, lots of lots of great stuff. But the kind of key thing is our newsletter is going to be going out next week. If you're not a member, then Chris will pop the link in or has popped the link in um, to the website so you can sign up there and you'll find out lots more um, from the group. So it's free to join. So just to let you know. And um, yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll be 
kind of telling people what we're doing in these webinars but the best yeah. way to keep in touch is to actually join the group and if you're wondering what kind of person would become a member of the copyright and online learning special interest group well we have an example here um, of this is exactly the kind of person sporting one of the new very exciting uh, t-shirts which is part of a range of merchandise that you can get it's part of the association of learning technologies um, shop so you might want to think about getting a t-shirt as well if that's the there's thing some, you're into there's we some other there's some other exciting products aren't there as there well. are there's, there's well there's a bag there's an apron there's all sorts there of is, things there is well, it's because... a shame we haven't managed to get hold of t-shirts yet you know how much we love t-shirts but anyway if you want to get in there they're first on order. they're on order yeah Chris. although i would yeah. say greg greg uh, walters there who's been instrumental in, in designing our logo um uh has already i think got himself a, 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 a t-shirt he's looking very very smart at it right okay other things, um, we also have the uh, uh, recording from the most recent Create Public Lecture, um, which was from uh, Emily Hudson, who's a regular contributor to these webinars, um, talking about uh, uh, her book, Drafting Copyright Exceptions, um, and also thinking about Brexit. So that's a, um, a really good, that was a really great uh, session if you, want to pick up on that recording um, then let's put the link in that there yeah and the blog post is a really good summary of mm. the uh, event actually as well so um, it's it's worth taking a look at that so yeah however that's not the last opportunity you get to catch Emily Hudson live in concert um, there's a really good uh, session coming up isn't there? an event coming up next week in which oh look there we are we're right at the top talking about call sig we're top of the bill of course practice. we're top of the bill um <laughs> and, but also emily will be talking there again about cop copyright exception drafting copyright exceptions we've also got the uh, brilliant hannah pyman talking about copyright doha game and john kelly from jisk talking about accessibility regulations so um i'm sure that's going to be an interest to people here um and we're very much looking forward to that event. yeah absolutely absolutely yeah yeah but that's not the only event is it no there's one more i think there is a very very exciting event happening two weeks today i can't believe it's not ice pops because it's not ice pops it's <laughs> it's online <laughs> so um our popular international copyright literacy event with playful opportunities for practitioners and scholars um, is back um, and it's going to be online um, if you haven't yet got your ticket then hurry hurry because they are literally selling like what did you call it cold lollies Chris. Cold, <laughs> cold, cold, cold ice, ice pops. creams i think i said ice pops didn't i yes we had yes, a bit of back yes. and forth anyway yes it, but it's the there. other really exciting thing is um that the program is now up so i'm just going to pop the program um the link in the chat um we haven't yet got a blog post about this but we're about to start tweeting about the program so if you're still um in an r in about whether you want to come along um, there's the link to the draft program that is now up and uh, there'll be a, a fantastic range of speakers at that event um, and there will be lightning talks and a world cafe in the morning and in the afternoon and there's going to be karaoke in the evening so it's it going to be is, amazing it is going to be very you've good. been having singing lessons deliberately haven't you Chris um, so that you can yeah. storm that karaoke I I don't want to reveal too much about what happens in the background um, okay, right then. I think it's time to move on uh, to our uh, featured presentation this week. Absolutely, yes, yes. So, as we said, we're absolutely delighted to welcome the team that is behind this uh, best practices in fair use for open educational resources code. So we have Will Cross, Professor Peter, uh, Professor Peter Yazi, Meredith Jacob, Prue Adler and uh, Karis Craig. Um, so we're welcoming Karis back, who's been on a previous uh, webinar with us. Uh, but we, we, we've tuned in to their presentation a, a few weeks back that we spoke about, and we've been in touch with them because it links very much to, to work that, that we're, we're doing and we're wanting to, to pick up here in the UK. Uh, and certainly we've been following uh, Peter and his work and the numerous codes that have been created over the years and the work he's done with Patricia Alfterheider that's been a, a real inspiration to us Absolutely. trying to work through um, how, how do you actually take 
the law and how do you provide communities or work with communities to work out how you do things in practice. Um, yeah. So I think without further ado, we're going to hand over to the team. They're going to do a, a joint presentation. I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you very much for joining us today. And shall I get the slides up oh. or are you ready to? Yes, that's a me? good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, so uh, just bear with us. I think uh, we're, we're just. Uh... And thanks, Meredith, for, for putting those uh, the link to the previous codes in there. Sure. Um, we do. Uh, the... oh, we can do... Oh, go ahead. Oh, you're okay. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. And as we okay. sorry, the only other thing to say is we will be having a response after this from from Stefan Kompel and Bart Maletti. But over to you, Meredith. You're going to pick this one up, are you? I am. Thank you. Um, and thank you everybody for uh, taking the time to join us today. Uh, having said that, maybe I think I'll start by talking about why I think it might be useful to hear uh, an hour about uh, fair use, even if it's not uh, currently available where you're working. Um, the first thing I hope to say, I hope to explain, is why I think when you're creating, particularly when you're creating open educational resources, that you need to rely on uh, whatever limitations and exceptions exist in your copyright system to bolster what is available under the public domain and what is available under Creative Commons licenses, that it's really impossible to fully meet your teaching mission and to meet um, your uh, obligations to equal access for all your students if you don't take advantage of the limitations and exceptions in your copyright law. Having said that, then I hope my colleague Will will talk a little bit about why, in fact, the way that we think about different types of uses in this code of best practices really line up more with shared pedagogical purposes that are going to be the same cross-border. And then Finally, we'll hear from Karis and Peter about how the, um, the legal freedoms that we're talking about in this code are not unique to US law or to fair use and are permitted in large part by fair dealing and by quotation law in other jurisdictions. And importantly, that where sort of at the margins they are not permitted, that it's important to make the case and to make the demand that the law needs to accommodate these core teaching practices, these core societal goals, not the other way around. That our, our teaching should not be tailored to the copyright law, that the copyright law should be tailored to our teaching needs. So having said that, we're gonna dive in. So in the first section of the presentation, what we wanna talk about is why despite the sort of easy appeal of saying just use openly licensed or public domain materials that often doesn't fulfill the full pedagogical goals of what we are public domain works are clearly a core foundation that can be used but because they're limited to certain types of works works that are either out of copyright or types of information or content that aren't protected by copyright there's this core set of modern materials, the materials created in roughly the last hundred years that are absolutely essential to learning and to discourse that are not generally going to be available in the public domain. The second big bucket of materials that OER creators often rely on are CC licensed materials. And those materials are very valuable and crucially are available to be used without any sort of discussion of purpose or context. In, in large part. And so I think it's very easy for OER creators to seek the sort of perceived safety of using only materials in the public domain or CC licensed materials. But in fact, one of the core reasons that we have limitations and exceptions to copyright law is because we understand that you need to engage with existing third party content to teach about it and to teach about the world. And so for that reason, we make the argument that it is in fact necessary to understand and rely on fair use and other limitations and exceptions when you're creating copyrighted materials. And here I would also emphasize that almost all OER creators already do to some degree. You know, there are very few, if any, OER creators who completely avoid using even short quotes. And similarly, uh, all OER creators rely on sort of fundamental ideas like the idea expression distinction, right? They, they reference and rely on ideas and content that is written before. So this 
reality that you need to understand and rely on limitations and exceptions is already sort of built in. And we just want to sort of encourage people to take that one step further and understand when and how the law is designed to allow them to incorporate and use third party content. Um, early OER efforts often focused on uh, STEM education and on science and math. And I think that that created um, perhaps a incomplete impression that it was possible to sort of treat OER as if it were a closed book test, to sit in a room and recreate stuff and start from scratch, even if that was really costly or sort of a waste of time, but that you could do it. Um, and perhaps that's true in certain, um, you know, maybe you could sit down and from scratch write an algebra textbook. But for most things, when you're teaching about history or art or political science, you really do need to rely on outside materials in some part. And the question is, when and how can you incorporate those directly into um, the OER materials? The other thing I will say, I think, which was made particularly stark during the last year and a half, was what cost is there to not doing that? One of the things that we see very often is OER creators and teachers uh, looking at linking out as a substitute to digging in about fair use or digging in about other limitations and exceptions. And I think one of the most worrisome things about that is that it um, puts the burden of that unreliability of linking out about whether those linked materials are in an appropriate context, whether they are accessible, whether someone who has low bandwidth can reliably access them. It takes all of those problems and it shifts it on to students who are already the students that are marginalized in the educational system. And so to the extent that in addition to the pedagogical goals of educational materials, we also have a commitment to meeting the equal access needs of all of our students on a level playing field that digging into limitations and exceptions and actually finding materials and incorporating them directly into the OERs is important to meet that goal. So that as uh, Chris mentioned in the introduction, this best practices is one of many that looks at how to take the legal foundation of fair use and implement it in a creative or professional community. And as you all know, fair use is a four factor test, but it's really condensed down to two core questions, which is, are you doing something new or different, something transformative with the material that you're using? And is the amount you're using, whether a part or in many cases the whole, appropriate to that purpose? So, you know, if a newspaper front page was originally used for its news purpose, and now you're using it for a historical purpose, that's your transformative purpose. And then the question is, are you using the amount of the page that's appropriate to give your students that context? That's an example. And if the answer to both of those questions is yes, it's very unlikely you're providing a substitute for that copyright in its original market, which is the sort of pocketbook issue that's relevant to fair use. I'll add that actually, since we first drafted this slide, there's another question that's been sort of hinted at. Um, in the Google View Oracle case, the um, opinion discussed also in finding for Google the sort of strong public benefit to this use. And I think while it's sort of unclear how that's going to play out in the long run as, as part of the fair use analysis, the OER community is well suited to explain how their uses align both with the underpinnings of limitations and exceptions in the copyright system and also with the public benefit intended through education and public debate. So these codes of best practices are um, part of a series of works that have looked at communities who rely on fair use to meet their professional or creative mission and then understand how certain repeated professional practices can be understood at a more concrete level than having to sort of sit down with those two fair use questions each time you want to make a use. So the process of these best practices is working with creative communities and understanding sort of what the repeated scenarios are and how to think through those two broad fair use questions in the context of repeated scenarios that come up for those communities. 
And in this best practices specifically, we, we knew that it was impossible to say we're creating a best practices and fair use for all of the education sector. That, while laudable, is not a goal that we could have met this year or even perhaps this decade. So we focused on a, a more narrow question, which was when and how does fair use allow you to take materials and insert them into OER? And so we're talking here about specifically taking some or all of a third party material and inserting it into a sort of packaged open educational resource. And that could be a textbook or a textbook substitute, that could be a set of student exercises, it could be a video, it could be any type of object, it doesn't need to be just a textbook, but we are talking specifically about that inserting in. And we hope that this will allow OER creators to do things, including engage with topics like media literacy and language learning that might have been very hard to do without relying on fair use. And that, as I mentioned earlier, that it will improve the accessibility and the durability of OER by not um, leaving key pieces out and hoping that links are maintained. And I think as we've seen recently, it um, is important, I think, that OER is sort of owned and controlled by the educational institutions that have that tie to students and that commercial services often uh, aren't adaptable enough to meet the needs of all students, uh, particularly in uh, emergency situations like the one we just saw or for students who don't have um, reliable access to the internet there's only situations in which being able to control the materials within your OER to format shift to deliver them in different ways is really important for meeting your students needs so the code is a tool for individual and institutional copyright education and it's a guide for reasoning through these repeated situations. It's also a useful way to talk to colleagues and gatekeepers to say, you know, my idea that I can rely on fair use here is, is responsible, is aligned with professional practice. And it also, by putting out this possibility, we hope will attract new makers into the OER projects, into the OER project broadly, and into creating new projects themselves. Um, that being said, the OER, the code is not sort of a guide to all of, all of educational fair use. It's also not a handbook on uh, getting the most out of Creative Commons licenses. There's, uh, Creative Commons has a certificate program for which all the materials are free and online. That's a better, um, a better sort of tool for that. And then finally, um, it's not a a sort of prescription of percentages or amounts. Uh, those amounts, I think, can seem easy, but they're unfortunately almost always wrong. That, you know, there, this, the amount you can use is so situation dependent that there are plenty of times where using the whole thing is permissible and other times where using very little is not. Um, the final thing that I would say the code is not is it's not a law degree in a box. You know, we do a lot of work with people who themselves aren't creating OER. Um, people who are copyright experts, like many of you are, in their libraries or their educational institutions. And this is not intended to allow you, in that expert role, to tell people the answers. It doesn't make you a lawyer if you are not one, but it is a tool for you to work with them to help them solve their problems, um, much as uh, librarians are often, and other sort of institutional experts are often used to helping people find resources to solve other problems. The final thing I'll say before passing this off to Will is that this code is really a very um, consensus-based centrist document. I like to say this is not about the borderlands. This is about the center. Um, it ref reflects the sort of broadly held views of the OER community that we captured through a series of interviews. And it's been vetted by a team of independent experts who are a little bit distant to the project itself. And so for that reason, as we um, hear about cases that are interesting and sort of end up in the news, it's important, I think, to remember that much of what we talk about here is in the sort of core domain of fair use. And for that reason, it's why, as um, Karis and Peter will talk about later, it lines up more than you might think at first uh, glance with what is permitted by fair dealing and the quotation right. I'm going to briefly display but not read our list of illustrious reviewers, just the group out there that I think is 
has given us this sort of check and balance that what we've heard from the community is also supported by the law. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Will, who's going to tell you a little bit about the code itself. Thanks, all. Thank you very much, Meredith, and thank you everybody for being here today to talk about this topic. Um, so I'm Will, and I'm excited to talk a little bit about what the code itself says and what that looks like in the sort of the, the bedrock space of the United States, and then hopefully that'll set up uh, Karis and Peter to talk some about applying it more broadly. I think what Meredith said about the value of centering practices rather than sort of the core uh, legal specifics as, a, as an opportunity to harmonize across borders is really, really exciting, really, really important. So I hope you'll see some of that here. As Meredith also said, um, the way these codes are generated is we have lots and lots of conversations with people in a particular field. And so we start to identify centers of gravity, things people tell us over and over. If you're a good open educator, this is the sort of thing you need to do. And those centers of gravity, we start to describe as principles over time. So the way the code itself is structured is there's sort of a, a use case. This is the sort of thing open educators need to and ought to be able to do. Here's a clear statement of principle. Fair use permits you to do that thing open educators ought to be able to do. Um, and then we nuance that some with a set of considerations. Think about this. Be careful about that. And then hard cases as sort of an outer limit. This isn't a get out of jail free card. Um, so here's, here's something that moves us maybe not in, into the borderlands, as Meredith described, but a little further out from the very, very dead center of the principle that we've been talking about here. So I'm going to talk through those four very quickly, and if you have questions, I'm happy to dive into them a little bit more deeply. Um, but the, the first sort of set of, of core practices that we heard about, this first center of gravity, was one that made us smile a lot, because from a fair use perspective, there's no better set of practices to be talking about. Um, bringing in materials from third party sources to use as objects of critique, commentary, and analysis is as core pedagogical practice, as you could imagine, but it's also as core um, sort of fair use practice as well. The statute explicitly calls out these sorts of practices. And so when somebody says, I'm writing a poetry textbook, I'd like to bring in an actual poem and have people engage with it. Either the textbook provides the critique and commentary or the students are invited to provide the critique and commentary. Um, great news, that's absolutely permitted under fair use. And so that's our first principle, bringing in materials for exactly that purpose. The second principle that we talk about is sort of a cousin to that. It's, it's bringing in materials not to explicitly critique, but instead to illustrate an idea or a principle in some way. Um, so when an educator says, I, I want to bring in these pictures of robots from different periods in the history of movies, um, I'm not going to be doing a close reading of those robots necessarily, but I want to illustrate the way that's changed over time. That again is, is a core pedagogical practice and a core practice permitted explicitly under fair use as well. So that was another easy one that brought a smile to our face. Um, and here again, we've got one example, but you could imagine an iconic image from history being used to talk about a moment in history, lots of different examples across disciplines for commentary and critique and for illustration as well. The third principle that we identified and we articulate in the code is, is a little bit different, but I think just as important in a lot of different ways. And that's the idea that, that fair use permits you to bring in content as a, as a sort of example of what's happening in the real world or in the lived experiences of people, particularly where it develops sort of understanding, engagement, and opportunities to practice in different ways. So the example that we heard a lot was some flavor of the example we have here on the screen, which is an, a language educator who says, I can make up a million silly, my name is Will, I go to the store kind of sentences or examples of language, but learning is just fundamentally different when students actually engage with the way the language is used in newspaper articles and in this case a telenovela that we've spotlighted as well right but this practice of bringing in things from the rest of the world to to practice the way it's actually done not just the way an academic might imagine and write down that it's been done and again that's that's core bedrock fair use that's very much the center of the map as meredith talked about it so so an easy and happy third principle for us to articulate in the code and then the final principle is, is uh, off on the side a little bit, but I think important in a lot of different ways. I like to think of this as the don't reinvent the wheel principle in some sense. This principle specifically speaks to the idea of incorporating existing educational or pedagogical content when, um, when those works have fallen out of commerce in some sense. So there's a textbook that was written in 1957. 
80% of it is tremendously out of date. It hasn't been available in 25 years. Um, it's basically fallen out of use, and I wouldn't want to use much of it. But the way it describes verb tenses, or the way it, it structures and articulates a set of issues in a process, um, I want to bring that piece in. And again, where there's not any, uh, what a fair user would talk about in terms of market harm or, or market substitution, um, or I often talk about it in terms of whether it's in or out of commerce as well, that's a fourth opportunity for people who are creating open educational resources to engage with the outside world, bring this thing in, um, and use it to build something new and better and exciting that, that is what we would call transformative in that sense. So those are the four principles as they're articulated. Um, looking through those four principles and calling back to a couple of things that Meredith said, I, I really want to articulate um, th this set of core values here. The first core value is something that doesn't really show up in the law, but it's something that we heard loud and clear as a best practice from open educators, is that there, there's a set of information that you need to provide when you bring in third party materials. Um, whether or not the law says you need to do that, to be a good practitioner, you need to do the work of attribution for example, right? That's something every single person said to us is, I don't know what you lawyers would tell me about my legal obligation to do attribution, but if you're not doing attribution, you're not being a good educator. So, so please mention that. And then the second thing that we heard a lot from folks, and this is something we may uh, sort of continue to, to discuss throughout the rest of the morning here, is thinking about open educational resources explicitly as a tool for downstream remixers and reusers in different ways as well. So if I release an, an OER, an open educational resource, with a CC BY license on it, and I bring in some third party material into that work, I need to make it clear in some fashion to downstream users that that third party material is not mine, and so the CC BY license doesn't apply to it. So some form of clear marking for fair use inclusions felt really, really critical. Uh, to our users and to us as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But I also wanted to, to sort of say again something Meredith said very well, which is that the core values that, that run through all these have to do with these questions about equity and accessibility in particular. That the work that we're doing here um, is informed by sort of the opportunity to do the best version of pedagogy, but also the opportunity to you know, not limit yourself to the, the safest or the CC licensed materials, but really to make sure the people featured in our books reflect the, the diversity of the world in which we live. Um, the resources that we provide are available to all students, regardless of whether they have hot and cold running Wi-Fi, or regardless of these other questions as well. <clears throat> and in particular, we spent a lot of time talking with people about that practice of linking out that Meredith mentioned and, and the question of why isn't it enough just to link out? And I think Meredith said this very well, so I'll just say it again quickly. Linking out really does create these, these um, problematics in terms of creating a resource that doesn't sort of degrade through link rot over time, but it also creates a whole set of issues in terms of really fulfilling uh, the commitment to um, equity and inclusion that I think animates so much of the open education community's work. Um, so thinking about fair use as a tool in those practices feels to me very, very important. Um, I'll also say sort of a parallel question to that that's come up a lot as we've been going around and talking to people about this is the, is the question of, you say the law says I can do that, but it doesn't feel ethical for me to do that. I, I feel like borrowing from this community makes me feel uncomfortable or use in this way doesn't feel appropriate. And so I'll say here something I've said in those other places as well, which is what the code can do for you is describe as large a universe as possible of choices for an educator to select from. And what we hope that does is it takes a lot of the copyright anxiety off of the table so that educators can properly center questions of pedagogy, uh, questions of equity and appropriate behavior and those sorts of things. So, so what you shouldn't take away from this is, yeah, take it all, raid and pillage and take whatever you want and who cares what they think. What you should hear instead is don't let the law get in the way of choosing the best resource, the most equitable resource, the most ethical resource, et cetera. That's what we really hope the code will do is give you the power to make the best choices on those other terms by in this moment centering where copyright permits you to do more than you might think you're able to do. Um, so quickly, as I mentioned a moment ago, the code recommends marking. Um, there was broad agreement that marking was appropriate. There was not broad agreement about how that should be done, what that should look like, how often that should be done, et cetera. Um, and part of that is about this is a code that touches so many different disciplines that it's, you know, a chemist would say we do it this way, an historian would say we do it that way. Um, 
So what we recommend instead is we offer a set of options in the code. We say, here are some ways to think about marking. We think it's important that in some way you acknowledge that you've brought in third party materials under the code, but the way you do that should be tied to the norms and expectations of the communities where you hope this resource will be used. So that could be indirect, that could be direct, that could be hybrid, et cetera. But, but think about that and then ground that in the specific expectations of your community. And then finally, this is this is a nice segue into Karis and Peter as well. Um, often, if you're somebody who's reading quickly, it's easy to skip past the appendices. I want to suggest to you that these appendices in particular are tremendously useful. I won't read through all of these bullet points, but there's a lot of good information about how the code was developed, um, how the code fits in the context of other aspects of United States law, like uh, patent and trademark and those sorts of things as well, how there are these sort of uh, related suite of educational exceptions that I know Peter's going to speak to a little bit as more as well, um, that are tremendously important in terms of actually doing this work. And then finally, this question of how does this code translate across international borders and jurisdictions, and how does it sort of have the opportunity to do some work of harmonizing those different uh, legal regimes and ways of thinking through things. Um, and so in that spirit, one of those experts that, that Meredith mentioned a moment ago is Dr. Karis Craig. And so it's my pleasure to step out of the way and, and let Karis talk to you about how the code um, aligns with the Canadian law where she uh, thinks and teaches. Thanks so much, Will. And thanks to Chris and Jane for the invitation uh, for bringing us together to talk about this today. Um, I'm here in my capacity as a Canadian in spite of the Scottish accent. So I um, have been in Canada since the turn of the century. So I'm not going to pretend to be an expert anymore on the current status of the UK law. But I did write my master's thesis actually on a comparative analysis of fair dealing and fair use in the US and the UK and Canada way back when. So I'm actually just really interested in talking about how these different concepts fit together and sort of mapping these overlaps and the divergencies that we find. And I think there's just a lot of lessons in there to be learned about understanding the sort of essential role that user rights and fair dealing or fair use play within the copyright system by virtue of how the system operates. In other words, as a sort of integral part of how copyright works in all of these jurisdictions. So with that as a sort of intro, um, my main contribution to the code was in the appendix on Canadian fair dealing. So um, the goal here was really to try to um, to ensure that this wasn't seen as exclusively uh, a US document that would be useful for people trying to navigate through um, OER and the making of OER in the US, but as soon as you're looking at taking it outside of the US, or you're looking at the Canadian market, then suddenly it becomes unusable. We really were convinced from the beginning that it would be possible to write a document and that, you know, as you've heard, is kind of in a core center of what is accepted in best practice uh, for the use of protected materials and make it something that would apply beyond the US. And so with a view to, to Canada, I was reviewing it to ensure that what was being said about best practices would be equally true in the Canadian law and then to make sure that that was facially apparent in the document because in Canada, and I'm sure it, it's much the same in the UK, we're used to hearing about what fair use permits, and there's a tendency to think, oh, well, that's all well and good for the Americans, but we don't have fair use. Uh, Canada, like the UK, is of course a fair dealing jurisdiction, and so we're used to thinking of that as, as restricting what it is that we're able to do. Um, on the other hand, when we're dealing with educational resources, we're dealing with short extracts and things that are being used for the purpose of teaching, for the purpose of ultimately private study, then we're very much within the domain of fair dealing. And so there's not really a reason why the same sort of freedoms, the same best practices wouldn't be available to people in fair dealing jurisdictions. So um, the main point, this is just a sort of summary of how um, we get there in the appendix, but the main point ultimately is that if a use of copyright material is for the purposes of education, private study, criticism and review, um, then we turn to the question of fairness and we can reasonably assume uh, that anything that would be fair 
in the US fair dealing, uh, fair use analysis would be fair under the fair dealing analysis, at least in Canada. Um, of course, this similarity um, is, is not ultimately a matter of coincidence. So I'll just jump ahead. This will be um, familiar to you. The fair use defense in the US, of course, emerged out of the UK courts as an equitable doctrine. So that's its history. That's what Canada inherited as well from the UK. So they have this convergence at the very beginning. Um, and what happened, of course, was that in the US, um, it wasn't codified until much later. And so there was much more uh, sort of gradual evolution of the concept of fair use in the US courts, whereas in the UK, it was, it was codified. And in 1911, it was sort of crystallized as having these restrictive purposes. So you had to bring yourself within the purposes of private study, research, criticism, review, or newspaper summary. Um, and that's, of course, what Canada adopted. So we have in the fair dealing regimes this additional hurdle um, that has to be met before we get to ask whether something is fair. And we also know that the UK courts, in the, especially in the sort of 1900s and the Canadian courts followed suit, kind of doubled down on that restriction uh, and took it very seriously such that many different uses were sort of eliminated at that first stage. Um, in Canada, some of you may know, there has been quite a dramatic development in the jurisprudence around fair dealing um, over the last 15 years or so. And so what we've seen, and this sort of traces back to the 2004 CCH case, um, was the court recognizing fair dealing as a user right, as essential to a balanced copyright system, and therefore as a, as a, a provision that ought not to be narrowly construed. So the Supreme Court said, you know, these are user rights. They're not just lo uh, loopholes. They must be given a fair and a balanced reading and not unduly constrained. And the court also set out a multi-factor test. It's very similar to the US fairness factors, thinking about the purpose of the dealing, the character of the dealing, the amount, the nature of the work being used, um, available alternatives to the dealing. So that's one sort of additional factor that's enumerated and the effect of the dealing on the work. So these factors, to be clear, emerged um, through the case law on the basis of the same statutory provision that mirrored the 1911 UK statutory provision. In other words, they were sort of derived from understanding the role of fair dealing in the system itself. This notion that fair dealing is a user right that's not to be narrowly um, construed is also present in the subsequent cases. So in 2012, we had several more cases where um, the court kind of doubled down on this idea of user rights. Um, in the Alberta case, which is especially interesting, it was held that teachers making copies for their students were engaged in fair dealing and they had no um, ulterior motives. Their, their role was in facilitating their students' private study, and that meant that um, their dealing was fair. And so this is important because just to note, it doesn't turn on the addition of education in the statute, which I'll mention in a minute. It was based upon an interpretation of the meaning of private study, and so again, based upon the statutory language that the UK and Canada share in common. Um, in Bell, uh, the court recognized that the dissemination of protected works is an important purpose um, that fair dealing ought to advance. So it's not just about transformation, but it's actually about the dissemination and sharing of existing works. And stressed that this purpose hurdle, the one that, that Canada and the UK share in common and the US does not have, that this was a low hurdle and that the real analytical heavy hitting, the real work is always done just in determining whether a dealing is fair, taking us back, of course, to the same factors that we find enumerated in the US statute, but which, of course, emerge from the UK case law. Um, so there has as well in the interim been, and, and this puts Canada in a, sorry, I'll stay here for a second, in a relatively better position granted. Um, education has been added as a purpose. So now we don't need to kind of um, argue that a teacher's purposes are in facilitating the private study of the student. What we can do instead is just say the teacher is engaged in education and that in itself is a fair dealing purpose which gets us to the fairness analysis. 
Um, so all of this sort of explains the, the similarities that we find between fair dealing um, in Canada and fair use um, in the in the US and, the, and we stress that you know open educational resources are going to get over this purpose hurdle, they're going to proceed straight to the fairness analysis and then the factors for assessing fairness are by and large going to be the same as the ones that are employed um, with a view to the same sort of public policy goals as we see being applied in the US. There are some differences of course um, and these are often differences sort of in, in terminology or maybe a little bit of a difference in, in balancing and some of these will also align I think with the differences between UK fair dealing and US uh, fair use right now. So there is for example like a less explicit focus on transformative nature of use. So this transformative use doctrine that the Americans are very comfortable with using it uh, doesn't really you know have a foothold a clear foothold in the Canadian law as such but it gets in there because when you're thinking about the purpose of the of the dealing or the character of the dealing the the transformative nature of the dealing and the purpose for which it's being used are of course important considerations in assessing fairness um the addition of and thinking about alternatives that might have been available was a concern to some people if they thought well you know maybe I shouldn't use something because I could always as an alternative not use it or use something something else that's less good. So what's important to stress is that that alternatives factor in the Canadian jurisprudence is understood to mean that if there's something that would be equally effective then okay use the thing um, where you don't have to rely upon fair dealing but where the use is reasonably necessary or would be better then you can rely on fair dealing that or, and that will weigh in favour of a determination of fairness. The other couple of things I flag here, wrap up very quickly here, um, the existence of moral rights is something that we find that, you know, and the US doesn't think about quite so much, um, but we have, um, of course, to worry about moral rights in, in Canada as you do in the UK, but once you've got attribution and acknowledgement, you're gonna be, um, you're not gonna be violating moral rights anyway in the uses that are being made. So just something to be aware of, but certainly working within the best practices, um, you're gonna be, um, you're not gonna be violating moral rights. So it's not really an additional thing to concern ourselves with. Um, there was one example I just wanted to mention before I pass things over to Peter, and this is that um, it's true that Canada has traditionally been more hostile as an environment for fair, fair use or fair dealing than has the US, and I know that the same is true of the UK as well. Um, but even when we um, look back at some of the older cases, um, because we're operating within the sort of safe zone and the core of fair dealing, we have cases going back to 1997 before CCH ever happened, before we had education added as a relevant factor, where a court accepted that you know the reproduction of 100% of a photograph of a front cover of a magazine was important for illustrating a point. It was apt to use it to supplement the message of the um, of the article that was being written. And so I think that this is the kind of use that we're really talking about, and it really is in the safe core of what is considered fair dealing in Canada, and I believe in the UK as well. So with that, I'm going to stop and hand things over to uh, Peter. Sorry if I took a minute or two too long. I'm looking forward to hearing what Peter has to say. Uh, Peter, are you with us? I am with you. Here I Excellent. am. Excellent. Um, so I wanted to thank Karis for the handoff and to say to everyone that I'm approaching this last segment of our talk with a, a great deal of humility because I am I am far from being an expert on UK or EU copyright law. But the the investigation I have done leads to some tentative conclusions which are reflected in one of the appendices to the Code of Best Practices but that I wanted to share with you in very, in very condensed form today. So may I have the next slide, please? I think we should go back one. Yes. No, let's go to the next. 
next slide, please. Yes, indeed. So the, the first thing that, that needs to be said has already been said quite emphatically, and that is that, it, of course, in the, in the array of national law approaches to copyright limitations and exceptions around the world, fair use is an outlier. It, 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 it exists in other jurisdictions. It's gradually being adopted in additional jurisdictions, but we're still talking about a large handful of countries at best. And then much the same can be said about fair dealing. There is a limited set of fair dealing countries and to make matters even a little more complicated, those countries often interpret their fair use provisions differently from one another. And so we, we can't always rely in thinking through the position of, of OER and the use of inserts in OER. We can't always rely on the kind of open, flexible copyright exceptions that are represented by fair use in the United States or by the <laughs> highly evolved fair dealing system of Canada. And it's important, therefore, to look for other alternative doctrinal foundations on which an OER best practices code could be built. Not necessarily foundations that will sustain exactly the same code that we developed with the US and Canada in mind, but foundations that could nevertheless enable the adoption of similar codes either on a national or on a regional basis. And I don't need, I don't want, I, I'm not competent to talk about it at great length, but I did want to point out before we get on to, to other possible foundations for this kind of a document in other jurisdictions, one that deserves exploration, and that is the uh, the category of educational exceptions. One of the reasons we rely on fair use so much in the United States in the education sector is that our statutory education exceptions are both out of date and sort of conceptually impoverished. And that isn't true in other countries of the world, as Daniel Sun's study points out. And although there are certainly difficulties, challenges with implementing the kind of best practices that we are discussing today, relying solely on a national law educational exception. It's not out of, it's not a possibility that's out of reach and it needs, especially in jurisdictions where there is no other obvious basis on which to go forward to be seriously considered. Next slide, please. I'm, I want to talk now about the, the next topic, which is the, the relationship between best practices and the quotation right. As many of you know, and as, as all of you can easily learn, the quotation right is a relatively venerable feature of the Bern Convention uh, to which I think most of the relevant countries that we are discussing or imagining today are either directly or, or indirectly parties. And although the quotation right has been a somewhat neglected aspect of the Bern Convention for decades, <laughs> it is now enjoying a conceptual revival. And that conceptual revival is probably best reflected in, in the new book called Global Mandatory Fair Use by professors, best, professors Applin and Bentley, from which um, I, I quote at some length here because this, this passage from the book um, expresses much better than I could in, 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 in my own words, uh, I think, 
I, let us say, an expanded and enlightened, a progressive view of the quotation right. And of course, the most important thing about the quotation right for our purposes is that like fair use, like fair dealing, it is subject to a general fairness test expressed through the words of best practices, or excuse me, expressed through the word of fair practice. And it is stated categorically in Bern Article 10.1 without categorical or subject matter limitations. In other words, the location right potentially applies to a broad range of circumstances in which quotation might be incorporated, appropriate, and to the full range of different kinds of works that might be quoted. Um, now, the Burn Article 10 1 quotation right has been implemented in many national laws, and in some of them, French law is a good example, the implementation has been very grudging, so much so that I think it raises questions about whether those laws are actually in full compliance with Article 10.1. Nevertheless, every country's quotation right is different. And of course, in applying the, or, or in, in, in identifying the quotation right as a basis for the erection of best practices in, in OER, those differences need to be taken into account. I also would mention, and this this goes back to something that Karis was saying in, in the discussion of Canadian law, that there is an attribution requirement in Article 10.1, mirrored in the national laws that implement Article 10.1, present as well in Canadian fair dealing, and happily, as Merit, as Will explained earlier, also present in our code of best practices, not because it was dictated by US law, but because practically every informant we had conversations with in the OER community felt that it was essential. Next slide, please. So, I want to turn back with the greatest of trepidation to the UK for a moment and talk in an extremely guarded way about what I think the present UK situation may be with respect to the question of whether it would be possible to go forward with a best practices document similar, not identical, to the one that we have created that for you, the US and Canada. The first proposition stated on this slide is one that, of course, Harris has already developed, and that is that fundamentally all of these Anglophone laws of limitations and exceptions come back to a common historical source, and that the notion of, of, of fairness analysis has been an essential element of those limitations and exceptions from the beginning. And the one of the things that I think distinguishes the present law of the UK from a lot of other national laws around the world is that it is clear, especially from the 2014 amendments to the to the to the 1988 Act, that the the UK legislature legislators have been taking the Article 10.1 quotation right mandate very very seriously. <laughs> there are a number of things in the 2014 amendment that amendments that have the effect of expanding the potential reach of U.S. fair dealing in the direction of the practice community with which we are concerned. Here on the, the, the slide, I cite only one of them, which is the 
explicit recognition that fair dealing is appropriate for purposes of illustration as well as critique and commentary. And especially since the line between critique and commentary and illustration in the use of inserts is concerned, this is an enormously important proposition for the, with respect to the possible future of such best practices in the UK. I think that properly understood, the, the sort of the new dispensation in fair dealing in the UK could be the basis for a code that included all or most of the topics touched on in the US best practices document. Uh, final slide, please. May I have the next slide? Um, okay. The challenges. What 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 lies ahead if one takes this the path that I'm I'm suggesting is a possibility. Well, one of the greatest challenges in the interpretation of the quotation line is the the its application beyond the sort of low-hanging fruit of textual quotation to which Meredith referred earlier. But experts, I think, have made a persuasive case, and they are backed up by the language of the 2014 amendments that, in general, and certainly in the UK, the quotation rights should apply with equal force to appropriate visual, audiovisual, and even musical quotations. And we all need to be on guard in our own jurisdictions between against restrictive interpretations of the right, quotation right, and 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 prepared to meet them with whatever tools we have. So with that, I think there's maybe one more slide. Yes, next steps. So let me just go down the list. Again, these are prescriptive and I, I I offer them with, with, with humility on the one hand and a certain sense of urgency on the other. OER practitioners who are ultimately responsible for their own fate in this space need to demand and to encourage interpretations of existing law which provide the greatest possible scope for their essential activities. And that's where best practices come in. Best practices, centrist in nature, consensual in source, are a tremendously effective way of pushing appropriate interpretations of as yet uninterpreted or, or, or lightly interpreted provisions of law. And the the problem I think that faces Europe, sort of zooming out now from UK in particular, is that as we've already suggested, and as is clearly true, for example, with respect to the US and Canada, cross-border sharing of materials adaption and adaptation of materials, translation of OER materials is going to be an important part of any broadly successful European OER initiative. And unfortunately, as we know, the local implementation of limitations and exceptions in European jurisdictions is uh, individualistic, maybe a good way of putting it, and and occasionally um, a, a source of, of 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 difficulty for this kind of cross-border sharing. So I want to close with the proposition, or a proposition that may seem to be contradictory to the 
ones that I was insisting on earlier in these remarks, namely that there were already a lot of features in international and national law that could enable a best practices approach to OER and suggest that in at least some jurisdictions, it may be that the that realizing the full potential of OER it will will not be possible until some kind of law reform takes place at the national level to uh, to introduce or to reintroduce an open flexible copyright exception we couldn't have done this in the u.s without such an exception and it may well be that uh, it it will be difficult to do it or to do it fully elsewhere um, without that kind of, of law reform. And that's, that's what I've got. I'm, I'm interested in reactions to these remarks and to our whole presentation. And so I think I'm just going to hand off now to Stefan Gumpel and, and, um, and, and Bart Maletti. Yeah, that's great, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Thanks or ever so much. Yeah. Um, thank you to all our presenters um, from your team as well. That, uh, and I think um, if we, we can kind of save the questions, I, I think uh, it would be great to hear from um, Stefan from uh, Bartolomeo um, with their reaction to what you've told us. Lots, lots of thought, food for thought there um, about the need for copyright reform in Europe and um, whether maybe some of the reforms that we've got in, uh, might be suitable. So uh, over to you two. Um, I'm not sure which one of you is going first, but um, the floor is yours, um, oh. Bart. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm going first. And thanks very much, uh, everyone, for your great and incredibly interesting uh, presentation and also for another excellent code of best practices in fair use. Um, yeah, I, I really want to thank you also because you know your work on the cause of best practices has really been uh, you know incredibly inspiring for us in a literal way. You know, it has inspired a pilot project that uh, Chris, Jane, and I have been working on uh, this academic year, uh, which is aimed at developing a code of fair practice for film educators, and it's also inspired a project that Steph and I uh, are currently working on for the Horizon 2020 Consortium, uh, Recreating Europe. And that project specifically uh, aims to develop codes of best practices for documentary filmmakers and curators of immersive experiences in the UK and the Netherlands. And as a first step, uh, Steph and I have recently conducted a series of online workshops uh, with these communities uh, to generate a picture of the copyright related issues that these communities uh, face and cross-border uh, uses of works uh, that rely on exceptions and how to deal with the territoriality of the law were among the most uh, prominent issues that have been highlighted by all the sectors that we've been talking to. So not just documentary filmmakers and immersive practitioners, but also uh, film educators. So I think, you know, today's discussion is definitely extremely relevant. And uh, I, I mean, I, I want, I mean, maybe we can discuss that uh, later in more depth, but I agree with uh, Peter's suggestion that, you know, the quotation right is probably the, the right basis in, you know, certain uh, jurisdictions in Europe and specifically in the UK to erect a code of best practices here. And especially, I mean, more specifically, I would say uh, section 30, one that a, uh, the quotation exception, uh, which is not limited by purpose. So it's very much open-ended is mm. probably the, the, the right one. Um, however, I mean, I would like to focus my short response today on also two other major challenges that have, um, you know, been um, um, mentioned uh, by, uh, you know, our uh, participants in the workshops with documentary filmmakers and immersive practitioners, which I think also apply to OERs. Uh, so the first one, which, you know, we had the opportunity also to discuss uh, in other occasions is the risk that by codifying permitted uses, one may end up uh, circumscribing activities. And uh, this one specifically uh, came up at the workshop with documentary filmmakers in the UK. Uh, so most participants at that workshop had no experience of relying on fair dealing and seemed to consider rights clearance basically the only viable option 
to produce archive-based documentaries that can be exploited fully and safely. Uh, this was for various reasons, uh, including the uncertainty surrounding exceptions and their lack of resources to properly learn about copyright. But in particular, it was because of the conservative approach of funders, broadcasters, and distributors who often require to clear rights in all the materials included in the film that they found, broadcast, or distribute. However, one participant uh, was a producer with extensive experience of creating documentaries about cinema and filmmakers, and who relied almost entirely on exceptions to reuse uh, film clips. So what the participants who didn't rely on exceptions expressed a desire for, uh, and I'm quoting here, uh, some form of centralized or collaborative support to help each other understand exceptions as a community. And more specifically, they thought it would be helpful to know uh, what uses have been considered fair dealing in the past uh, and so be able to rely on those precedents. However, the participants who already rely on fair dealing on a regular basis argued that, and again, I'm quoting here, uh, because it is a wild west and a gray area, uh, the practice of relying on fair dealing has, has expanded hugely in the last 10 years or so and is very little challenged. Uh, the danger of suggesting a clearer framework is that you end up circumscribing activities. And according to this participant, basically there is a benefit in being small and below the radar. I'm quoting here again, uh, you get away with a lot and never get challenged. So their concern you know, didn't relate just to the challenge also discussed by scholars in this context that you know, by encouraging certain practices, you may signal that other practices are questionable. But you know, they, had, they were concerned basically that in practice, they are sort of pretty happy you know, with how things work uh, for, for them now, you know, in their words, uh, dodging between the lines and getting to do stuff and that bringing this conversation to the fore you know, may alert copyright owners who may then start challenging uh, those uses. So on this point, my question is, uh, you know, how can we respond you know, to, the, to the need of the majority of filmmakers that we talk to who are keen to better understand, discuss, and rely more on exceptions, while at the same time responding to the concerns of you know, this producer and others who feel kind of comfortable in the gray zone in which they currently operate? And also whether there is like a similar challenge, you know, with the open educational resources uh, community. Uh, the, the, my second point uh, was raised by a couple of curators of immersive experiences uh, in the other workshop, and that concerns the format and sustainability of the codes. So these participants uh, were aware of existing guides and information about copyright, uh, but they stressed that artists and organizations only have a certain amount of time, and again, I'm quoting here, to absorb and learn all of that information about copyright, and then the law changes and moves on. And this results in artists having a very dangerous, tiny amount of knowledge that's best ignored, so you go straight to somebody that does know. And you know, I think this quote basically raises several important questions you know, about the sustainability of these initiatives. You know, so one is you know, if copyright users like filmmakers, uh, curators of immersive experiences, or authors of open educational resources you know, only have a limited amount of time to think about copyright, then what is the most effective format for the codes of best practices? And does that format uh, need to change depending on the sector? And my last question is, especially now that we are thinking about and exploring the possibility of creating global versions of the codes, how can we keep track of legislative changes in different jurisdictions? Uh, so I appreciate, you know, these are quite a lot of uh, challenging questions, so I just wanted to put them all out there. Uh, but yeah, if you could just pick one or two and share your thoughts on those, that would be incredibly helpful. And once again, thanks very much for your great work. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, there, there, Bart. So I think at this point, so uh, 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 the questions I think you're asking there about um, how do we? I think Peter's got his hand up, so he's interested in in answering those. I just wanted to add to that. I think that's a very the thing that's been on my mind uh, about this is how we deal with the um, industry and uh, th those those. Uh, organizations what they might uh, think about it um, so I, I'll hand over to Peter Steph were you also going to come in with some comments as well or shall yeah, I, I also, hand over to Peter to, to respond to any of those I have some comments but I'm also okay. happy if, if Peter goes first to answer some of Bart's questions I'll be very quick because 
I think there are the the U.S. experience in this area, which is now you know, 16 or 17 years in 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 all, the code of best practices in documentary filmmaking in 2005, having been our our first outing in this area. I think we have some practical as well as some theoretical responses to Bart's question. One is simple, and that is that the, the although scholars have sometimes expressed concern about the notion that the codes would end up limiting as much as enabling um, the the activities in the various fields of practice, it simply hasn't happened. One of the reasons it hasn't happened may be that the codes have always been drafted in a way that makes it absolutely clear that they represent a centrist norm and not rep, not outer limits on the application of fair use or in, this, in the case of OER fair dealing as well. Uh, maybe it's also the case that once these ideas simply take hold, take hold, they're sort of irresistible and they can't easily be restrained uh, by a piece of paper. Um, so uh, if you look at what the, the, the original code of best practice, what, what we were discussing as applications of fair use connection with the 2005 code of best practices for documentary filmmakers and compare that to what filmmakers are now actually doing with the code under fair use, it's two very different worlds. There has been a tremendous flowering of individual practice, which I think the code has had the uh, uh, the the effect of releasing rather than constraining. The, the sustainability question that Bart raises and is an extremely important one. Any copyright guidance document, including a guidance document about limitations and exceptions risks becoming irrelevant as time passes and new law is laid down. And that's particularly true of documents that try to establish metrics to say, well, you know, 15% of that or three bars of the other or a thousand pixels of this. As Meredith pointed out earlier, the codes of best practices don't do that. The codes of best practices describe a thought process that practitioners can use to get from a, a presentation of a question about whether an appropriate exception applies to a conclusion easily, quickly, and with robust results. And documents in that form, or at least our experience has been over 17 years, seem to wear very well in terms of sustainability. They, they incorporate, they absorb uh, change, or developments in law rather than sort of breaking open because of them. So I'm, I'm actually um, a little bit um, confident based on experience that although theoretically that's clearly a significant problem, it doesn't seem in practice, once again, to have caused anybody harm. Now, then there's this other thing about invisibility. Wouldn't it be better just to fly below the radar? And that's a, we heard that a lot 17 years ago when we were talking to documentary filmmakers. And of course, it's true, perhaps, for people who already get it, who have good lawyers, who have lots of experience, it isn't true for everybody else. It isn't true for new entrants into the field. It isn't true for students. It isn't true for people who are trying new things rather than sort of plowing ahead in, a, in an established furrow. What we haven't seen is this um, eruption of, of sort of negative feedback from industry. And I think the reason is very simple. And that is, they have the best lawyers of all. And they know perfectly well that these codes of best practices are founded on reasonable centrist interpretations. And if they were to harass someone all the way to a courtroom, they'd lose 
which would in turn impede their ability to shake everybody down for licensing fees they actually shouldn't be paying. And I'll stop there. Yeah, that's great, Peter. Thank you. Um, can can we get Steph to um, uh, do a response as well? I know you've got some points you wanted to pick up. Um, and if others have got anything they want to raise, pop that in the chat. We're not going to have a lot more time, I think, at the end of the session for questions as we're due to finish um, at 3.30. But um, yeah, over to you, uh, Steph. Okay, thank you, uh, Jane. And uh, thank you for all the presenters uh, for this great, uh, great overview of the Codes of Best Practices for Open Educational Resources, really informative and uh, it's great to see you. And I actually really like this move of exporting the ID that of course originated in the US to different jurisdictions. Um, that's also my first comment uh, is about, it's uh, actually about these different jurisdictions. Um, I really liked uh, uh, Kara's presentation where she showed that uh, the US norm kind of resembles in the, 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 the fair dealing doctrine in Canada, possibly also the UK. and then Peter uh, ties to that, that uh, a similar norm can actually be found in Article 10, uh, 1 of the Berne Convention. I stick there, that's really great. Uh, but uh, uh, with this last norm, and this is a bit the elephant in the room, Article 10, 1 of the Berne Convention is of course a minimum standard. It doesn't say that we have to actually explain the quotation right in an as broad fashion as Tanya Applin and Lionel Bentley suggest in their excellent book. And um, uh, so what Franz did, they, they applied a very narrow quotation right, similar as many other European countries. Uh, I think the, in the Netherlands, we, have, we apply a bit broader quotation right, but not uh, uh, even close to uh, what the, the fair dealing allows or even close to what the, the fair use norm in, in the US allows. So the harmonizing effect of the Berne Convention or other international treaties might be less uh, strong than we would hope that it could have. Um, and then the question is, uh, and uh, Peter uh, rightly pointed this out, then what you need in order to get a code of best practice to move across other jurisdictions that do not have such open norms as fair use or fair dealing is you need copyright reform. So the question there is, do you think that the, the codes that you have developed uh, uh, would actually, could actually inspire uh, jurisdictions to apply a broader and a more open norm, or even apply a broader quotation standard as Tanya Applin and Lionel Bentley uh, describe? So that's one, uh, one, one question. Another one is a very short remark uh, uh, and that's, uh, that, that, that ties to uh, uh, Meredith's uh, statement and also actually will cross uh, Example. So Meredith stated that these uh, uh, codes of best practices are bottom-up approaches. They 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 are informed by sector practices, which make them very strong. So actually, what what Peter just also gave as a remark to to actually fighting the industry, meaning that these are norms that arise in practice and they are considered fair and they are based on, on on common norms. And what will add to that is the ethical approach. That's what we actually also saw uh, back in our interviews with, uh, with documentary filmmakers. This is an interesting thing. Relying on fair use or fair dealing or the quotation right isn't a permitted act. You don't need at all uh, 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 consent from the right holders concerned. In the Netherlands, all documentary filmmakers that we spoke to were actually convinced of, even if they would use an audiovisual work under the quotation exception, they would still find it appropriate to inform the filmmaker whose items they used that they're doing it. And that was based also on, on, on an ethical standard. And they also explained this because I immediately asked, why do you do this? Because uh, you don't need to. So their answer was, we also would find it appropriate if they would ask us if they're going to quote our film that you were producing in their work. We're not going to say that they can't if they do it fairly under quotation right, fair dealing, or fair use. So, the ethical uh, uh, part of the codes is uh, is very strong, uh, I would I would say, and I would uh, want to leave it uh, to this. Thanks very much, Steph. So uh, yes, Peter or someone from the team want to respond to either one of those comments? Um, I, I'm I'm happy to 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 take certainly the first about the the sort of the inspirational value of the codes. I think the answer to that is clearly yes. I think that. We have seen that in the U.S. at various different levels over the last 17 years. We've seen 
the existence of the codes um, push practice in, in new and productive directions, we've also seen the codes begin to influence the formation of legal doctrine. There is, uh, and maybe somebody could put it in the chat, an extremely interesting recent case called Murano against the Metropolitan Museum, which involves a, a muse, an online museum practice that was specifically discussed and approved in the uh, College Art Association Code of Best Practices and Fair Use for the Visual Arts. And the Metropolitan Museum, when challenged by an individual photographer, relied heavily on the uh, CAA Code of Best Practices from, I think, 2011. And in the end, um, they, they, they were, they were, their efforts that their defenses were crowned with success at both the district court and the circuit court level. So it's taken a while, but we're beginning to see uh, overt illustrations of the codes sort of leaking their way into law formation. And I want to emphasize that in the U.S., we don't, at least most of us, don't want to do law reform with respect to fair use itself. We, we, we tend to think that for all its, its, its warts and wrinkles, Section 107 is probably the best formulation of a fair use doctrine that could be achieved, and it could probably never be achieved again if the issue were to be reopened for reconsideration. In other jurisdictions where the current level of recognition of limitations and exceptions is lower or less complete or less flexible or less open, I am convinced that strong centrist codes of best practices can also be a tool in bringing about legislative reform. So I'm very, I'm very optimistic about that. I think it's a reason to go ahead rather than a reason to, uh, to you know, uh, sort of um, hesitate uh, in, in, in my view. And the question about ethics is interesting. I mean, we've seen a good deal of that in our work as well. The specific ethical question that was raised by your informants in the Netherlands, Steph, has not come up. In our, in our practice, partly because I think many documentary filmmakers don't feel themselves actually to be part of the same community as Hollywood studios or big television networks whose stuff they want to use. Informally, I think they do a lot of that kind of, of notification of use among themselves, one doc filmmaker to another, but most of them would not feel that they had to give 20th Century Fox notice that they were using a, a four-second clip from a, a, a movie. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. That's that's really helpful. We are running out of time, so um, unless there's anything really key from anyone else in the team they want to bring in at that point, um, I, I think it's sort of, uh, uh, you know, it is really kind of fascinating to see um, how your work on the codes might be able to be translated. And I, uh, it's certainly something that Chris and I are very keen to work with uh, the community in the UK, specifically uh, this one around open educational resources to adapt. And I, I see Emily's been in um, some questions. I, I think really this is just the start of this conversation in the UK. We're massively grateful for you all to you all for joining us and I think we'd really like to hear from people um, particularly who've joined the webinar today or who are tuning in afterwards if they want to work with us on this. Chris do you want to say anything? I see Peter's got his hand up so he's probably going to come in. I wonder whether he, uh, you've looked at, at um, Emily's question. I think if we can have one more comment I think then we'll, we'll bring the session to a close but absolutely this is a really great opportunity to think about how we might get this work uh, going around in the UK and the rest of the world. But over to Peter. <laughs> 
Um, so uh, two points. One is that that will be very happy to the extent that it is useful to to look through the the chat and to try to respond in whatever format or forum makes the most sense to the issues raised. Yeah, I'm thinking and, perhaps we could do a follow up blog post or something. And and yeah, yeah that would be got, yeah that would be yeah. and. And with respect to Emily, I think Emily is is is, is absolutely right. Um, the process by which the codes in the U.S. have helped to, um, well, I would say two things. They have helped to create practices in the sense that they have encouraged people to use the thought process that the code describes to analyze new as well as familiar situations as they arise. And since they documentary filmmaking, there have been lots of changes in the technology of the field over 17 years. The approach of the codes, which emphasizes thought process rather than, than prescriptive outcome, has proved to be quite adaptable. When we started doing this, for example, filmmakers didn't use social media content in their films because it wasn't easy to harvest and and apply in fact of course since 2005 there's been an explosion in that area many documentary films do make use selectively appropriately briefly of social media content of of citizen journalism and 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 self-reporting online and they do that now not be, not despite the code which doesn't specifically mention this issue but i would argue at least in part because of the code which is like fair use itself sort of capacious and flexible enough to accommodate new circumstances and 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 encourage progressive results and i think i will stop there thank, thank you, you all tremendously for for having us Thank, thank you, Peter. You. Yeah. Thank yes, you. this this has just been so fascinating, and there are I mean there are actually loads of questions on my mind as well. Things like in the UK we have um, educational licensing kind of hard baked into our legislations. So how does that fit in? We have questions you've mentioned out of commerce as part of that. Now we have specific out of commerce provisions in the EU, but then the UK has left the EU. Uh, we clearly don't have time. We're over time now. But what I would like to say is if this is the beginning of this conversation about how we work together. There's lots of, I think, uh, energy and excitement and desire to do something. Um, so we, we're keen to continue this conversation. So thank you very much for taking the time, all of you on, on the team. Thanks to, mm. to Bart and Steph for your excellent comments as well. And we definitely want to uh, pick up on the things that we've we've surfaced here and put them in a format that we can share these as widely as possible and certainly reach out into the edu open education community as well as the copyright community in the UK. So Absolutely. thank you again, Absolutely. everyone, for all your time. Yeah, yeah. Please drop us a line, anyone who wants to uh, uh, follow that up with us, because, as I say, uh, we are aware of the time. But we're just going over to our final wrap-up slide, Chris. I'm having some trouble getting the slides to share. <laughs> Okay, Thank you, Leo. Right. We were hoping you might say that, Leo. So definitely um, uh, looking to you and members of the um, Alt Open Ed SIG. So, so the, the final point we were going to make, we do have, uh, I can't believe it's not Ice Pops, as the next event that's kind of part of the series, but actually something different. And in fact, mm -hmm. our guests today uh, certainly will. Um, will be joining us for one of those sessions, but the, the program that, that Jane shared is earlier. We do have a number of other topics that are on the on the list. Um, copying literary works is something that's very relevant at the moment. Uh, uh, discussions around controlled digital lending, but there are many other provisions we're looking at discussing in the UK. Um, we know that we universities have been hit with quite a few infringement notifications from photographers. The practice known as copyright trolling so we're working on um, and we're speaking to colleagues at Creative Commons to see if they can come and help us because there are some issues. Yeah we've got a provisional certain... date actually for that event haven't we Chris? We do yeah. we're looking at the 23rd of July so we'll be in touch yeah. with that 
yeah. we're still always discussions about audio visual works um, and we're also looking ahead to the academic year I know I've been doing a lot of work how do we uh, navigate those challenges when we're in this kind of halfway house between is it full lockdown is it not what's happening what do the, those principles that we discussed during that time of crisis mean for a future operation copyright and, and hybrid learning that's where copyright we're going and next, hybrid right? learning so yeah. there we go so at this stage we will thank everyone again and we yeah. will uh, stop the recording if I could get